In 1966, the residents of Greenway Avenue, Ohio, were living the American dream. That dream, however, was about to be shattered when a neighborhood family were brutally murdered in the very place they called home. This is the Case Remains podcast, episode 16, The Unsolved Murder of the Bricker Family. Gerald John Bricker was born on January 25th, 1938, in San Francisco, California. He was hardworking and athletic, a competitive swimmer in high school. After school, he attended Stanford University, earning himself an engineering degree when he graduated in 1960. He soon found himself a job at the Monsanto Plastics Facility and was transferred to their Seattle arm. Five years after Gerald was born over in Illinois, Linda Jane Bulaw came into this world. Linda's father, Adolf, owned a welding and engineering company, and thanks to lucrative government contracts during the Second World War, business was doing well. Linda graduated from high school in less than four years and went on to train as an air stewardess for United Airlines, qualifying when she was just 18 years old. Gerald and Linda crossed paths in Seattle, and it wasn't long before they became an item. They got married on November 25th, 1961, just five months after they met and two months into Linda's pregnancy. A young couple with their future ahead of them, ready to take on the world together. Though their union was a hasty one, they were very much in love, and Jerry's family adored Linda, believing he'd found a great match in this bright young woman. On June 9th, 1962, Linda gave birth to a little girl who they named Deborah Ann, or Debbie for short. In 1963, they decided to make the move to Cincinnati after Jerry was transferred again. And so the young family, with their two dogs, Dusty and Thumper, took up residence at 3381 Greenway Avenue, Bridgetown. The area was exactly what you might imagine 60s American suburbia to be. Families filled the split-level three-bedroom houses and spent summer evenings sat on their porch. Children played out on the quiet streets and front doors were left almost permanently unlocked. The residents of Greenway Avenue got together for block parties and backyard barbecues and were happy to welcome the brickers into the fold. Though friendly, they mostly kept to themselves perhaps uncertain if they would have to move again for Jerry's work, or maybe feeling a little out of place on a street comprised of mostly older families. In fact, many of the other residents affectionately referred to Jerry and Linda as the kids. September 25th, 1966 was a Sunday, and Jerry attended Mass at St. Eloisius Church before heading off to work at the Monsanto Plastics Facility. It wasn't unusual for him to work at the weekends, and he stayed there all day, stopping off to pick up some milk at around 8pm on his way home. The rubbish was due to be collected the next day, and Jerry took the trash cans out to the curb. A neighbour who was out walking her dog passed by, and she and Jerry exchanged the usual neighbourly pleasantries. No one can say for sure the series of events that transpired after Jerry made his way back inside. All we do know is that they ended with three people murdered in cold blood. A couple of days later, on the Tuesday evening, the Bricker's next-door neighbour, an electrical engineer named Richard Meyer, became concerned. He noticed that the Bricker's cars hadn't moved, and their empty garbage can and two days' worth of newspapers were still out front. He called Monsanto, who told him that Jerry hadn't turned up for work for two days. Richard and another neighbour headed over to the Bricker home and could see the lights shining from inside where the dogs were barking incessantly. He knocked on the door, but no one answered, and so he turned the handle and pushed it open. Richard fought in World War II, and the smell that hit him was instantly recognisable. It was the unmistakable smell of death. Police arrived at the scene and Richard was brought into the house to identify the three bodies that lay inside. Jerry and Linda were found on the floor of their bedroom. Jerry had a sock stuffed in his mouth and had been stabbed nine times in the back. 
Linda had ten stab wounds in her chest and abdomen. Little Debbie had been stabbed four times, her body so tiny that the knife had gone all the way through it with each strike. Jerry was wearing his work clothes but no shoes, while Linda and Debbie were dressed in their nightgowns. Lieutenant Herbert Vogel was tasked with solving this brutal crime and assembled 13 men to work on the case. Can you say whether you have what you consider to be any good leads or clues in this case at this point? I can't say at this point. Where were the victims found? Mr. and Mrs. were found in their bedroom, what apparently is their bedroom, on the floor. Was he uh, laying across her? No. Where was the okay. child found? When will we get in her those? bedroom? Next 15. Right. Has criminal okay. assault upon her been confirmed at this time? No, it has not been. I, I don't know where that information came from. Right. Is there anything that would suggest it in your investigation? I can't say. It's often stated that if police have no leads after 48 hours of a crime, the chances of a case being solved falls dramatically. For the Bricker family, the investigation had barely begun. Police quickly determined that the murders had occurred any time between 10pm on Sunday evening, when Linda's parents had made a phone call to the house, and 6.30am on Monday, presumably at which point Jerry would have usually left for work. The autopsy report revealed that Jerry and Linda had been bound before they were killed, and also uncovered a small piece of medical tape on Jerry's chin, indicating that perhaps the sock found in his mouth had been taped there during the murders. Due to the positioning of the stab wounds, to the left on Jerry's back and to the right on Linda's front, police determined that the killer was likely left-handed. There were also some shallower cuts to Linda's face, indicating that she had put up a fight. Though it was widely reported that she had been raped, the autopsy report only concluded that she had been sexually active within the couple of days before her death. Meanwhile, police officers began to examine the scene of the crime. They revealed that they had found some unusual fingerprints in the Bricker family home that they'd lifted from the two bedrooms where Jerry, Linda and Debbie were found. According to Lieutenant Vogel, they were on items that wouldn't normally be touched by someone simply visiting the home. On the sideboard in the Bricker's dining room was a set of knives with one missing. It looked like police had their murder weapon. Just a few days later, police released a photo of the fork that accompanied what they believed to be the murder weapon, an ornate fork with carvings on its teak wood handle. Judging by the size of the fork, they believed the blade of the knife was between five and seven inches long. Police used cameras to search storm drains and sanitary sewers near the home in case the killer had discarded the weapon nearby, but unfortunately they came back empty-handed. So now they believed they knew the murder weapon, but what about a motive? There had been some drawers open in the house, but apart from that there appeared to be no sign of a struggle. Only Jerry's wallet was missing, with an undetermined amount of cash inside. It certainly didn't seem like robbery was a motive, and soon both neighbours and police began to think that whoever murdered the Brickers was no stranger to them. Debbie, like most four-year-olds, was highly inquisitive, and so the set of knives was kept well out of sight, possibly left in one of the drawers that was later found open. Of course, their discovery could have been mere coincidence, or it could have been that they were used by someone who knew exactly where they were kept. Many people from the neighbourhood had reported that Thumper and Dusty were very protective dogs who would bark at anyone who even went near their backyard. In fact, even now the Bricker's neighbours recall them having to be shut in a different room whenever anyone went round and only let outside so they could take care of their business. But despite this, nobody had heard a peep from the dogs on either Sunday night or any time Monday. In fact, neighbours hadn't heard any noise at all from the Bricker home despite the nearest houses being situated just feet away. It seemed strange that if there was an intruder in the house, nobody heard the dogs barking at all. Some newspaper reports mentioned that the dogs had been sedated when the murders took place, although there was never any evidence to confirm this. Writer J.T. Townsend, who's written a book on the Bricker case, believes that Debbie was killed for one reason only. 
that she would have been able to identify the killer. Many of the residents of Greenway Avenue agreed that it was the kind of place where a stranger wouldn't go unnoticed. In fact, Richard Meyer, the neighbour who had discovered the Bricker family, said that his wife had seen a strange man around just a week before, but that she didn't think she'd be able to recognise his face. As police were trying to crack the case, the crime was having a profound effect on the community of Bridgetown. People were petrified where they had once felt safe and began buying anything they could to protect themselves in their homes. Adoption rates of large dogs suddenly jumped by an alarming rate. People petitioned for more streetlights, and for the first time a night shift was introduced by local police. A neighbour, Nettie Cordell, lived a few doors down from the Brickers, and was closer to Linda than others in the street, because Debbie and her daughter Darlene were playmates. She told police that for around a month before the murders, Linda had been acting strangely, like she was scared of something. She always used to let Debbie run back and forth between their houses, but all of a sudden she was asking Nettie to call her when Debbie and Darlene had finished playing so that she could come and collect her herself. Some believe that her nervousness may also have had something to do with the recent attack on two other United Airlines stewardesses. Lonnie Tremble and Lisa Wick were sleeping in their Seattle apartment when they were savagely beaten by an intruder wielding a piece of wood. Lonnie was fatally injured while Lisa fell into a coma which lasted for two weeks. When she woke up, she had no memory of the attack. There has been some speculation that this incident and the Bricker murder were related, though some reports state that Linda had worked and even lived with Lonnie and Lisa They were still in high school when Linda started her job at United Airlines, so a connection between the two seems unlikely. Lonnie's murder has also sadly gone unsolved, though there are a couple of suspects in the case. Some state that 19-year-old Ted Bundy worked just four blocks away at the time of the crime. He would go on to attack a number of girls in the Chai Omega sorority house, carried out while they were sleeping soundly inside. The weapon he used was a piece of wood. The MO may be similar, but it is worth noting that there is some debate as to whether Ted Bundy would have been in the area at the time, with some stating that he didn't begin work at the store until 1968, two years after the attack on Lonnie and Lisa. Bundy always denied committing the crime, even as he was due to be executed. The other suspect in the case is the son of Lonnie and Lisa's landlord, who committed suicide a couple of months after the attack. Among his possessions was a scrapbook filled with newspaper clippings about the case. In fact, there were a number of cases that police believe may have some connection to the Bricker family. Just one week prior to the crime, a 21-year-old woman named Valerie Percy was beaten and stabbed to death in her family home in Illinois. The daughter of prominent Senator Charles Percy, she was attacked in her bedroom while her father, mother and sister were sleeping. Valerie's mother was woken up by the commotion and ran into the killer as she headed to Valerie's room. He shined a torch in her eyes before fleeing the scene. Not only did the murder occur just a short period before the Brickers, but there was another similarity between the two cases. Like Valerie, Linda was the daughter of a wealthy family from the Chicago suburbs, and the two had moved in similar social circles. Chief Investigator Herbert Vogel travelled to Chicago shortly after to look into any connection between the two, but was unable to find any concrete evidence. The January following the crime, police believe they may have found yet another link, this time between the Bricker family murders and the fatal stabbing of 20-year-old Ruth Marie Fleeman. Ruth, an employee at a canvas manufacturer and part-time waitress, was found dead in her home, stabbed 17 times in her head, neck and chest. She'd been struck with such force that the blade of the weapon had snapped off in her skull. A Mount Washington salesman, 24-year-old Richard Lynn Kuntz, was charged with her murder, though again police were unable to find any evidence linking him to the Brickers. Police conducted hundreds of interviews throughout the investigation, the sheer number of people questioned a telling sign of the effect of the murders. They looked at almost everyone who had contact with the Brickers, even interviewing Linda's beautician. 
Richard Meyer, the neighbour who discovered the family dead, was even briefly considered as a suspect, but quickly ruled out. Of the 300-plus interviews on file, police flagged 16 as people they would like to speak to again. One of those people was Dr. Fred Leininger. Dr. Leininger was a vet and owned the Glenway Animal Clinic in Cincinnati. Linda was hugely fond of animals, and on the week of her murder had done three days' work at the clinic as a temporary receptionist. There were rumours around town that Linda and Dr. Leininger were having an affair, although there was never any evidence to confirm if this was the case. Then, of course, there was the tiny piece of medical tape that was found on Jerry's chin. It hadn't come from within the house, so it must have been brought in. A veterinary clinic seemed like just the kind of place it may have come from. By 1967, County Prosecutor Melvin Reuger announced that they had narrowed their search down to one suspect, but that a recent court ruling was preventing them from interrogating him. Three months earlier, the Supreme Court's Miranda ruling required police to advise suspects of their right to avoid self-incrimination by remaining silent and to have a lawyer present during questioning. The police failed to read the suspect his Miranda rights before they first interviewed him, and he hired a lawyer the very next day. The lawyer drew up a list of requests that the police had to fulfil before they would be allowed to speak to his client again. Among the list of requests was a written account of the questions they wanted to ask him, his lawyer's presence at all times, and a time of place of mutual convenience for the interview to be carried out. The lawyer then allegedly told a county detective that even if the police provided all the information he asked for, he would study and consider it, but even then would probably not allow it. With the Miranda ruling so new, police were unsure how to navigate the pushback from the suspect's lawyer, worried that one wrong move would mean that any information they did receive would be inadmissible in court. Reuger has never specifically stated whether Dr Leininger was the suspect in question. However, he has said that Dr Leininger had done a 40-minute taped interview at his place of work, but that he'd refused to give any samples or speak to the police any further after that. Dr Leininger continued to run his veterinary clinic in town until 1995, when he and his wife retired to Florida. Although their public obituaries state that Dr Leininger and his wife passed away months apart in 2004, detectives on the Bricker case tell a different story. According to them, Dr Leininger and his wife committed suicide together in a Cincinnati hotel. The truth of the matter was... Besides a few latent fingerprints, police had very little to work with. Hair, blood and fluid samples were all collected from the crime scene, but DNA testing wasn't around at the time. Some of the evidence was sent to the FBI for testing, and one month after the murders, Lieutenant Vogel told the Cincinnati Enquirer that the results of one of the tests confirmed a belief that the detectives had, but that it didn't point to any one person in particular. Unfortunately, by the time more advanced testing was available, many of the samples were degraded following improper storage, rendering them essentially useless. With few clues and a suspect who wouldn't talk, by 1967 the number of detectives working on the Bricker case was cut down to two. According to Vogel, the suspect they had was eventually dropped because there wasn't enough evidence to go on and the years without justice slowly turned into decades. 2013 saw a renewed interest in the case when the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office announced that they were looking into the old evidence in the Bricker files once more. As well as sending fingerprints for testing, they were also looking into submitting physical evidence again now that the technology had advanced. If they have uncovered any new information in recent years, however... It looks as though they are keeping it to themselves. Without evidence, of course, there are only people. Someone out there who's willing to talk or someone who simply can't bear the guilt any longer. Now, over 50 years later, many of the residents of Greenway Avenue are in their 70s or 80s, some sadly no longer with us. But still, every so often, a detective will pull the box of the Bricker family case notes off the shelf They'll comb through its yellowing pages, filed away but never closed. 
Thank you for listening to episode 16 of the Case Remains podcast. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can do so over on Twitter and Instagram with the handle Case Remains. And you can also visit our website, www.caseremains.com, where you'll find write-ups on missing persons cases and unsolved mysteries. This week, I'd also like to introduce you to a brilliant podcast by a true crime author, blogger, and all-round lovely lady, Emily G. Thompson. Morbidology is a weekly true crime podcast hosted by me, Emily G. Thompson, author of Unsolved Child Murders and co-author of Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. 911 emergency. My son shot my husband. I need an ambulance. He's bleeding. Using audio from 911 calls, interrogations, trial testimony and interviews, Morbidology takes a look at some of the most mysterious and disturbing crimes from all across the world. Do you know why you're here? For a uh, home invasion gone terribly wrong. From shocking murders to missing children, we focus on a variety of cases and put you, the listener, right into the middle of the investigation. Listen to Morbidology now on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean and wherever else you get your podcasts. That's all for this episode of the Case Remains podcast. Until next time... Stay safe.